Is Christianity and Catholicism compatible with feminism and socialism? As a philosopher, a Catholic, and an American, I have made a few videos refuting and disagreeing with certain popular Catholic YouTubers on these grounds as my beliefs on these subjects are tied into my identity. This will be my strongest refutation of these men and their views to date. As recent issues in the Roman Catholic Church have raised their reactionary rhetoric to mutinous levels, Dr. Tyler Marshall, Timothy Gordon, and Michael Voris are schismatic rabble-rousers who are ultra-traditionalists disguised as YouTube scholars and theologians, exploiting current real and ugly controversies and scandals to grow an audience, get published, and gain their own works exposure. These men are doing more damage than good for the American Catholic community, creating division where there should be unison against a growing tide of hypocrisy and blasphemy as I can think of no worse blasphemy than evil priest using the name of God to justify sinful and wicked acts. As of recent, these men have made certain claims about Catholicism, Christianity, feminism, and socialism as they relate to each other in a type of pseudo or proto or postmodern liberation theology that I would like to refute by looking at a definitional understanding of these terms. I used Webster's Encyclopedic Dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy, and Hardin's The Pocket Catholic Dictionary to check my definitions, verbiage, and usage against. Let us start with their claim of Catholicism being a religion of unchangeable doctrine, best expressed in the Latin vernacular. For me, as is backed up by my sources mentioned above, Catholicism is the faith, ritual, and morals of the Roman Catholic Church, with Jesus as its head, the Pope as its mouthpiece, and its faithful members of the Church as its body. Intended for all humankind, it is the general, universal, of broad, liberal, inclusive, practical, and metaphysical applications, tradition, and doctrines through the lens of Christian theology. As for the name Catholic being appropriate to this entity called the Roman Catholic Church, it was coined by St. Ignatius of Antioch between AD 35 and AD 107, while pertaining to the whole Christian body, it makes exclusive claims and has exclusive characteristics of truth, unity, sanctity, and apostolic succession that includes the adherence to such faith and its organization. It is part of the Christian body that recognizes the papacy and other patriarchs, but is not Protestant. It also means that it is inclusive of customs, doctrine, and dogma, as long as those elements are considered to be orthodoxy, as defined by and explained by the Apostolic Fathers, and continued in its tradition as overseen by the bishops as distinguished from heresy since the time of Christ. And it originally referred to the undivided church before the Great Schism of 1054. Thus, by this definition, these men, Marshall and Party, demonstrate almost slavish dedication to the oral tradition as it is recorded in doctrine and dogma is equivalent to Protestants' devotion to sola scriptura. Their claims about Christianity do not hold up much better as they describe a judgmental, wrathful religion with tyrannical doctrines, making them sound more Calvinistic than Augustinian in their views 
of what Christianity is. Well, what I have learned and been taught is that Christianity is the particular Christian religious system that claims faith in the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, and the deposit of faith thereof, including its teachings, morals, and spirituality as it relates to the beliefs, practices, principles, and conduct of the people who follow Jesus Christ. These people claim Christ Jesus as their Lord, God, and Savior, and recognized the Trinity, that is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as defined by the Apostolic Church Fathers, and expressed, that is, evident in the canonized Gospels and Epistles of the New Testament Biblical Scriptures, including the rites and mainstream branches of Western Catholic, British North American Protestant, and Eastern Orthodox churches, as well as its minor branches of Oriental and Coptic churches. These men, Dr. Tyler Marshall, Timothy Gordon, and Michael Voris, have categorized socialism, communism, and feminism as absolute evils and grave mortal sins, and have all but accused Pope Francis of being a member, or at least subject, to these movements and their philosophy. But what are these philosophical political systems, and are they by definition diametrically opposed to Christian Catholicism, as these men claim. Socialism is the theory and political system of social organization in which the means of production are not in private hands, but under social control, as relates to wealth and power. This system demands the collective ownership of means, interest, production, and control by the community as a whole and advocates for the equal distribution of capital and land among said community, usually as prescribed by Marx, Lenin, or Mao. While Marxism is opposed to Christianity by its very nature of being anti-religious, elements of socialism are compatible with Christianity just as elements of progressive social reform and social justice are compatible, utilitarian, and complementary to democracy. And what of its twin cousin, communism? Communism, or collectivism, is a social economic theory and system of communal self-government in which each connected community forms a federation based on state ownership of property distributed down ethnic, gender, cultural, or economic lines, expelling free market mechanisms of control, supply, and demand. This is the exercise of the political principle of centralized social and economic control. And while the argument can be made that this type of political system leads to a type of social tyranny where every man and woman is their own tyrant. The church has stood up for monarchy, republicanism, representational governments, direct democracies, and other forms of national governments its members have been subject to throughout the years. After all, we render unto Caesar what is his. Our souls belong to God, not to the state. But what of feminism? Is it an evil movement that promotes abortion, promiscuity, the emasculation of men, and an end to motherhood and an end to traditional families? Well, Let's take 
an honest and simple look at what feminism is or what type of feminisms are at its core. Feminism, philosophically speaking, are the doctrines that advocate for social, political, and reproductive rights for women. And the organizations and movements who advocate for those rights. Feminism being originally concerned with the asymmetrical distribution of powers and rights that led to the biases that subjugate women to subordination and disparagement. And their goal being the end of that subjugation, subordination, and disparagement. There is much here that is compatible with Old and New Testament, that is compatible with Judaism and Christianity. The incompatibility comes from two places, Genesis and Paul's epistles. And while some may point to Deuteronomy or Leviticus as points of contention, the principles and the place to find the potential reconciliation thereof lays in Genesis and the epistles. As both men and women were asked to submit to God and to each other in obedience and respect. That is without denying hard and even harsh realities. So let's look at masculinity and femininity and let's ask the question, are they truly incompatible? Masculinity, is that pertaining to the traditional attributes, characteristics, and qualities inherent to men and male individuals as relates to strength, boldness, and gender, while femininity are those qualities of feminine womanliness seen collectively as a whole, as pertains to traditional female attributes as relates to sensitivity, gentleness, and gender. I think it is a mistake to look at these qualities as mere virtues or vices on their own, but instead it is more preferable to look at these traits and these trait sets as simply quantifiable quantities that are complementary to each other. And while one sex or gender may be more prone to one set or the other, that does not make either set mutually exclusive to the other. But what are Catholics defending when we defend the patriarchy? Is it manly, masculine authoritarianism? No. Here is what Catholics, theologians, and doctors of the faith mean by patriarchy. A patriarch is simply the male head of a family, tribe, right, or church. This is the founder or personage who has authority over other members of his group. For the early church, these were the holy fathers of Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, Constantinople, and Jerusalem, who ruled over Catholic sees, as well as the heads of later Catholic sees, such as the Coptic Ethiopian, Nestorian, Armenian, and Russian sees. But more broadly, these are the male elders of a community as a whole. But does having a male-only priesthood mean that we are against female leadership? Or that we are against a matriarchy? Well, let's look at what a matriarchy is. A matriarch is simply a female head of a family 
or tribe, or a woman who is a founder of a community or a group. And a matriarchal system or community is one where a matriarchate has developed. This would be a family, society, community, or state governed by a matrix, that is, by the mother. Now, the church has both mothers and fathers of the faith, and women have been powerful doctors of the faith just as men have been. So the idea of matriarchs and patriarchs ruling and guiding together is not antithetical to our faith, as both the masculine and the feminine should be respected and protected. While a misogynistic or misandrist order would not be tolerated by the church, and while I also see and acknowledge the tension that exists between these two groupings. I do not see this division as unreconcilable, as I will now expand upon returning to the topic of feminism, the goal of social, political, and reproductive rights for women, and the right for women to organize and gather as a group is something most Catholics throughout time would agree to and would agree upon as being a good. And again, most Catholics would agree that the goals of ending or preventing the subjugation, subordination, and disparagement of women is a good. It only matters the framing, the aim, and the degree of that goal. For instance, if reproductive rights were framed as an ending of state-mandated abortions and giving women the right to choose to keep her child or giving the woman the right to choose to keep her child in societies where such a right is not granted as self-evident, then yes, Catholics would and do support that right to choose within that framing. Suffrage and having the right to vote is another universal right most Catholics would support for all women of the age of reason being weighted the same and equal to men of the age of reason. Just as Catholics support and fund monasteries for monks, so Catholics will also support and do so willingly and fund convent, convents for nuns. This framing and reframing can go on and on, but you get my point. Yet there is another phase or factor to this refutation. These men, Tyler, Timothy, and Michael, have said that part of the problem is not just the isms, but the toxic soup that they make when combined, called liberation theology. So what is liberation theology? Well, liberation theology is a Christian and more specifically Latin American Roman Catholic movement that makes criticism of oppression and the mission of social justice its central task. Its adherents seek justice and rights for the poor, for minorities, and for women, as well as sometimes violent retribution against racism, sexism, oppression, and economic imbalance. They justify these goals and actions by emphasizing biblical themes of liberation, social Christianity, and by the preaching of the red-letter social gospel. This religious socialism is based on the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth as taken separate from the epistles or the Old Testament, making a new Bible out of just the four Gospels, 
These Christians believe capitalism to be idolatrous, rooted in greed, and a mortal sin. Christian socialists identify with the suffering inequality of the marginalized, of minorities, and of the oppressed. It is a synthesis of Christian theology and liberal social, economic, political theory popularized by Marx. Such theology found fertile ground in the 1970s in regions such as Peru, Brazil, Uruguay, and Spain. The evangelical context of liberation theology emphasizes evangelism and social responsibility. Similar theologies have developed in repressed and poverty-stricken areas, such as the so-called Black Theology of South Africa and some U.S. ghettos, PLT in Palestine, Dalit in India, and Mingguang in Korea. Unfortunately, liberation theology misrepresents and reinterprets the Bible in new ways departing from recognized Catholic, Christian, and apostolic tradition. These are radical, revolutionary, anti-capitalist, sometimes anti-governmental sects who have incorrectly and only partially interpreted the message of Jesus. They do this misinterpretation by divorcing the message of Jesus from the rest of the Bible, viewing him as opposed to that more complete message most Christians and Catholics accept. While I am sympathetic to liberation theology, its cause and its main goal, I cannot deny that liberation theology is a perversion of Christianity. And to this point, I must concede to these men that in this toxic toxic brew, there are versions of radical feminism, of socialism, communism, and matriarchhood that are incompatible and antithetical to Roman Catholicism. But in the same time, there are also so-called Christianities which are also incompatible and antithetical. These Christianities fall outside of the definitions I gave earlier and include Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, and Oneness Pentecostalism. But as religious and faithful, we do not judge all of theism on the actions of Hindu cult leaders. Nor do we judge all of monotheism on the actions of radical Muslim sects. Nor do we judge all of Christendom on the actions of witch hunters or on the incidents in the wars between Catholics and Protestants. Nor do we judge Christianity and Christendom on the conflicts and actions taken between the Baptists and Anabaptists. So, we should not judge feminism, progressivism, nor even collectivism by the actions or goals of some or even many of its more radical members. As history would not look so kind on many of our ancestors' previous actions. Peace, like, and subscribe. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please comment down below. There's a lot to discuss here. There's a lot to parse out. So please, I want to see comments. I want to have a conversation. Talk to you all later. Have a great night.